Welcome to this new video of the Computer Recreations playlist. Today we'll have a look at an article by A.K. Dudney, published in the Scientific American magazine on April 1985. We'll see some Python implementations as well. The links to the article are in the video description. The article is called 5 Easy Pieces for a Do Loop and Random Number Generator and explains five applications of how random numbers can solve problems and show some interesting properties. We'll concentrate on the three problems I like the most. You'll find the links to the codes of all five problems in the video description. The first problem consists in finding the approximation of a value of pi using random numbers. Although not named explicitly in the article, this is also known as the Monte Carlo method. As you can see here, we have a square inside of which is inscribed a quarter of a circle. The square has side 1 and the circle's radius is 1. Now generate a series of random points on the Cartesian plane between the origin 0, 0 and 1, 1. This picture from Wikipedia shows 3000 random points. The red ones lie inside the quarter of a circle while the blue ones do not. Very roughly speaking, by counting the number of points fallen inside the section of a circle, you can estimate the area of a circle. In the end, you have to multiply by 4 because we are dealing with one quarter of a circle. Since the radius is 1, the area of the circle in this case is equal to pi. The formula to compute the area is, in fact, pi times r squared. How do we know if a point falls into the quarter of a circle? Easy, just measure the distance of a point from the origin of the axis. For this, we can use the Euclidean norm, also known as Pythagoras' theorem. Let's take a random point as sample and apply the algorithm. This green point lies inside the circle because its distance from the origin is less or equal than 1. Since we have only one point as sample, and this point is inside the circle, we get 1 divided by 1 equals 1, and by multiplying it by 4, we get 4 as a bad approximation of pi. The opposite case is when the random point is outside the circle. In this case, we get 0 as approximation. Having said all this, we can now have a look at the Python program called Pint. The first function is a one-liner that computes the distance from the origin using Pythagoras' theorem. Instead of manually calculating the squares and doing the square root, Python's hypot method can be used. From a mathematical standpoint, the two operations are the same, however, there are differences when dealing with very small or very big numbers. Hypot is implemented as a dedicated function. Let's go to the fire function. This one is easy. Generate two random numbers that represent the random point. Find the position of a point. If it's inside the quarter of a circle, increase the hit variable. All of this is in a loop that repeats iteration time. The function returns the number of points in the quarter of a circle, i.e. the hit variable. Now we can look at the main method in the script. The user must pass the number of iterations and processes to the script. You can notice here that I've used the multiprocessing module. This way the problem can be parallelized. The fire function gets executed in parallel based on the number of processor cores of the running system. In the end we get the total number of hits and attempts, i.e. the points, and as I explained before, we have to multiply by 4. This problem is suited to be parallelized because each call to the fire function is independent one from the other. The result of one call does not influence other later calls. Before the program finishes, we can also see the percentage shift between our approximation of pi and the one preloaded in the math library. Now we'll see what happens when we run the program. Let's start with the base case of one point, which is obtained by passing one iteration and one process to the program. We can only have two cases, remember? In or out the quarter of a circle. Now we can use the two parameters and adjust them to see if the estimation converges to pi. It's a matter of probability. Sometimes you get a more accurate value with a few samples and sometimes 
even if you have 10 times more, you get a less accurate one. The third program is called Galton. Here we have this box called Galton board, where balls start from the center top position, and by gravity, they fall down to one of the destination columns or bins. All pegs are equal, so the probability that a ball goes right or left on each level is 50%. To compute the probability that the balls go to the far right of the board, we can easily multiply the probability of going right for each level. In this example, there are seven level of pegs, thus eight bins. We have to multiply 0.5 seven times because we have to change the probabilities. So it's 0.5 to the power of seven, which is about 0.008, i.e. the probability of a ball ending in the far right bin, where the Galton board has seven levels of pegs, is about 0.8%. Using a general computation method called probability mass function, we can compute the probability of each bin. If we number each bin with an integer starting from 0 and use 7 as our n, we get the same result as before for bin 7. Here is the distribution of probabilities. Each lot has its own value, which you can compute easily with the function. You just have to compute half of the values since the other half is mirrored. Now we can have a look at the Python script. First of all, we need to pass the number of balls and the height of a ball via the CLI. We then need to create the bins. A list full of zeros can represent them in their initial state. The length of a list must be height plus one, just like in the picture where we had seven lines of pegs and eight bins. The external loop controls the input of new balls, while the internal one controls the current ball. Each loop repetition represents a level of pegs. Only a single variable, write, is necessary to control the destination bin at the end. When the program terminates, there is a print operation for the status of all bins. Let's try to replicate the distribution we've seen earlier. With 1000 balls and 7 level of pegs, we expect the far right and left to be about 1%, that is 10 balls while the middle ones would be about 30%, i.e. about 300 balls each. Using the same method, we expect 160 balls in bins 2 and 5, and 55 balls in bins 1 and 6. As you see, this works. Let's see the fourth problem, which is focused on ballots. This program starts with a rectangular grid. Each slot of the grid represents the opinion of a voter. There can only be two possible opinions, i.e. political parties, white and black. The grid is populated with random opinions. The program works like this, select a random voter, the red square in this case. Select one of its eight random neighbors, let's say the voter marked with an orange X. The opinion of the voter gets changed to the opinion of the neighbor. In this case, that voter changed opinion from white to black. All of these operations are inserted in a loop which is executed a certain number of times. Depending on the size of a grid, different things happen. Sometimes, after a few thousand opinion changes, all voters would vote for the same party. If you print the matrix, you will see blocks of voting opinions during the program's execution. As the grid increases in size and the number of opinion changes remains the same, the number of absolute winnings decreases. Probably, to get absolute winnings for bigger grids, more voting sessions are needed. Of course, there are special workarounds when dealing with voters near the border of a grid, and we'll see them in a moment. The first function, 
called view, is the one that prints the status of a grid. The grid is implemented as an n by m matrix. White voting tensors are stored with the number 0, while black ones with 1. This function simply prints the matrix and replaces the ones and zeros with asterisks and dots respectively, as suggested by the author of the article. The result function counts the number of white and black votes in the grid. Finally, we get to the main function. The script needs six arguments as input. We need to pass the size of a grid and the number of opinion changes, of course. The article also suggests to try to reverse the opinions of the neighbor voter, so we need an argument for this as well. The last two are the total number of elections, i.e. reruns of the main routine, and the enable view option. This last one calls the view function I explained earlier. For each election, we need to create a random grid. This while loop controls each opinion change. First of all, we need to choose a random voter and then one of its neighbors. Instead of addressing the eight neighbors with a number from zero to seven, I decided to create this small loop that does the selection by skipping the voter. Using the mod operator, we can wrap around the grid. Once we have the voter and its neighbor, we need to set the new vote intention and optionally print the grid. Before the program finishes, we need to count the results and display them. Let's see what happens with a small grid of 42 elements. We can see block of votes formed after 500 iterations, and some of the time we get an unanimous win. If you use the reverse voting option, it seems much harder to get a unanimous win. The final voting opinions seem well balanced. There are still other two problems to look at, zombie and quing. These two still concentrate on random numbers and on other numeric distributions. You'll find their link with the code along with the others I discussed in the video description. That's it for this video. Like and subscribe to learn more about these computer recreations. Bye bye!